Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Irish Goodnight. You are here for a very special episode of Vault Tech University. Um, I'm here in the bright and early day with fellow streamers and content creators Repatriate Girl and Honor and Steel, also known as Far From Heaven Podcast. And today we are reading through the um, first couple chapters, maybe even the intro of Frank Herbert's Dune with our avatars here. So let's do a quick roll call. We'll start with our guest, and then we'll move through the vault staff that are present. So, um, Honor and Steel, from, who created the uh, Far From Heaven podcast, they are present here with, whoops, Forder the Raider, who you will meet if you are able to listen to their podcast on one of the many outlets. Um, I think is Spotify is where I hit it up, but you could go on their website and see or check with them. Over here, on another lovely couch is our fellow Twitch streamer and Goodnight Monkeys uh, Raider and, and team member Repatriate Girl playing Cassie, head of vault security. Um, oh, nice new backpack. And of course, I am your host and lead of this rogue institution here, uh, Ivan, the Irish Goodnight. Whoops, see there I am disappearing. And... I wanted to take us today to a really special place. We're going to go to the planet Arrakis. We have to start on Caladan. Of course, our avatars will stay here on Earth. But we were lucky enough to find copies of Frank Herbert's Dune within, um, actually, in for my case, the basement. I'm not sure where everybody else found theirs, but for me, the basement of my university. And I found this beautiful hollow tape uh, read by some pre-war voice actor and there it was. I was hooked. I actually went through the entire series, and then I found out that Frank Herbert's son was able to create a bunch of prequels to his father's work in the wake of his father's death uh, before the Great Bombs fell. And so uh, those notes and those manuscripts were also salvaged by me, and over the years we're going to talk about them as well. But for now, we're going to stay with book one in the Dune series, uh, which is called Dune. All right. So, um, everybody, if you'd like to say hi to Honored Steel or Repatriate Girl, they're here. Um, and I'll let them know whatever you type out so that you can say hi back at them. Cool. So, um, let's start off with clarifying things that are going to confuse um, our friends. So, we're dealing with a book, and um, what do y'all think are some of the big takeaways you've, like, seen so far? You know, like, what, what, what the hell? Like, is this like a romance? Um... <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a, well, I guess later on there's a little bit of it, but I wouldn't say this is a romance. One of the things that, at least, and I, I'm sure we're going to talk about it a little bit, but that kind of, I had to go back through, read it back through a couple of times, the whole question of whether or not someone is human, I thought was interesting. Oh, so that's crazy. No, that sounds <laughs> awesome. I'm glad you brought that up. I think that's within what we were talking about today. The test to be human kind of sketchy right yeah hey savvy thank you for your subscription bro much love to you Yeah, I'm definitely interested in the like discussing the way it's written too, because it's like, sorry, I'm playing with with colors again, um, because it's like it's assuming so much of me, right? Yeah, it is. It's like you're drawing all of an episode of something, and you just have to pick up. You have no idea what the backstory is on anything, and just kind of drops in the middle of the story. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and um, there's like there's a few examples that kind of as a writer myself really kind of sort of got my nerves a bit. Um, for like a reader, it's probably also just a really really big for music as well. Um, and certainly like pop music, I remember her first time I ever read this book. Um, I was just sort of like, what, what the hell is this? Why why do I need to know what that? <laughs> yeah it's assuming you know a lot and even and i totally forgot there was even a little glossary at the back of the book and while i appreciate that you know sometimes that's sometimes frustrating because you have to go back and go oh what's this or and then in my case there was something i was looking up that i assumed was in there that was not in there and i still have no idea what it is but i'm sure it will be revealed later yeah. like or it won't you're like what the hell <laughs> You know, you talk about this like off and on every other <clears throat> chapter, and now there's I've no still have no idea what it is, and the book is done. <laughs> there are definitely better ways of handling that in the in the whole world building and a, a glossary at the back of the book, um, mm -hmm. especially with people reading more um, books on um, yes. digital media, like. Mm -hmm. What's up, Empress Freya? Great to see you. Mm -hmm. Welcome uh, to Voltec University, everybody. Yeah, there's, there's definitely ways that um, a writer can use that point well to sort of make the world an awful lot more immersive. Yeah. How do you yeah. feel about um, footnotes? That just popped into my head. So, like, when I was reading Neil Gaiman's. Um, Oh, what was the most uh, American Gods? There's a lot of the little footnotes. It's almost like a, a narrative from the author as opposed to the narrative in this, a narration from the story. What do you what do you think about those? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Neil Gaiman's definitely a lot smoother than Frank Herbert, don't you think? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's just yeah. that's something. Yeah, with his and Terry Pratchett, same thing. A lot of I don't know if it has something to do with. British writers, because there's, I think, <laughs> um, the guy that did Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy does the same thing, or did the same thing. Yeah, that, that's kind of useful, because it's not, it, it, you're not having to flip pages to mm -hmm. read the, the glossary, and, and if you're like me, sometimes you get to that, and then you're like, right, where was I reading? Um, you know, it's like, what page was I on? What, what was going on? I'm kind yeah. of forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, is I feel that um, plenty of examples of where it's 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 kind of like if if you're going to include something like that in the actual text of the story, then you kind of have to make it relevant and make it relevant to the scene. Um, you know, um, don't just sort of like drop it in there as part of like a right like particular example. Um, with like the first two chapters that we men that we read was like the, the, the specific wood that Barnhart the Barnhart Golden's table was made of and it was like, Well that's great, right. it's made out of this elf can wood and I'm like, What is that? Why is that relevant? Um, Why indeed, right? <laughs> that's so funny. Like, it's, it's, <laughs> is it like, magic wood? <laughs> well yeah, exactly. It's like if if it's is it is it a major trading export um the harp on it. Um, um, is, it, is it a major trade thing? Is it a particular word that is a massive status symbol? Because the whole the whole description at the beginning of it is is basically kind of sort of to hint at the excess of hoarding over indulgence that makes people mm. want to harp on it or like. And it, yeah, it kind of felt like that was a bit sort of like if it was me writing it, I would have been like. Does my reader need to know this? No, don't mention it. <laughs> 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 well, you are a lovely but, storyteller. I very much enjoy the Fallout Far From Heaven podcast series. Um, yeah, but there's yeah, there's just so many, so many other better ways of um, world building and uh, bringing things. Uh,
What's usually your process for world building? Because I know there's a lot of different ways out there that people can do it. Is there... Do you have a specific way that you do? As I'm going to take notes on how you do it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> for my own knowledge. Because <laughs> I'm um, terrible at it. <laughs> and, and this is, like, totally separate from the podcast, because it's, um... I mean, I, I don't really have to do huge amount of world building here, because it's already established in the Evans world. Thanks very much, Kapusa. Um, <laughs> very good. Own, Love it. Um, but for my own... physics that I'm writing more sort of fantasy and, and it's kind of similar to sort of sci-fi in this which we use um it's yeah it can get quite it can get quite in depth just because I'm that kind of person so there's a lot that I write in the background and then in the case of at least then I've got it and it also helps then if I've, if I've got something written there in the world building then I've got it just because I've written it down and all that background writing doesn't mean it has to be mentioned in the story but if it does sort of have a process of actually writing the draft and you sort of think oh hang on a minute this this is actually not a bad point where I can actually use this that I've written sort of the background world building lore um, you know if it's if it's relevant and if I can use very much a person for writing through the main characters' details, putting profiles on them, um, doing those sort of like hundreds of questions to answer to sort of flesh them out. Um, and even things like, uh, even thinking about, and, and again, another sort of fantasy sci-fi thing is thinking about the different cultures of countries mm -hmm. and where they're from. That's really interesting. Um, what are some ones that you think are great examples? Um, so, one, you know what, I really need to catch up on this because I know there was a, a book the last book that was put out, the latest uh, book put out. Um, so, it was the, the Storm Archive series, which is ongoing. Uh, oh. Yeah. Um, and there are so many interesting ideas in there. Great audiobook um, too. You know what, I really the Stormlight Storm Archives or something? Yeah. They get these little emotional friend spirits that like react to the them. I don't know. Sorry. Go ahead, Honor. Oh, cool. Okay. It's um Spren. Spren. It's they're really awesome. I describe them poorly, but there's um yeah, there's there or something else entirely and, and I don't know that it it doesn't even begin to scratch the surface so far in the books. I think there's more in the last book that I read. There is you, you start to learn an awful lot more, but um, yeah, they're they're really fascinating. It's really well done. Um, and 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 that similar to Dune, um, it has the, the world in that series. It has such a unique environment. Um, wildlife and even the plants are unique 
quickly adapt to life in that world. Um, but it's been it's been done so well, and there are people that take notice of it and describe it to the reader. Um, but it's, it's 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 done well. It's not a case of um, you're a bit bamboozled as to what it is, but if they understand and they show rather than tell what something is and why it's relevant or why um, why why it's it's, it's kind of clear why um, it's been mentioned and detailed about it. And yeah, you, you, know, you don't often have to go back to a glossary or um, a data or anything like that to sort of remember. Maybe if it's been a while since you've read or something's been mentioned, um, but not as a first first encounter of something in the story, um, which is nice. I mean, although I do get that the the worms and shoot are mentioned a bit more, you kind of don't um, you kind of don't just come across them and don't understand quite so much about them. Um, yeah, but they're they're pretty central to it, so I suppose more attention should be laboured on them. Yeah, the author really obsesses on. Uh, the, the worms I would say throughout the franchise mm -hmm. um. but no I think I think that that series is a really good example of um, world building and in such a unique way as well um, yeah it's, it's probably not a bad probably not a bad comparison actually between that and, and uh, the world of Arrakis and um, in that um, I think for me, I find, and I still find, the descriptions of the worlds that you come across in Dune, I find them very difficult to sort of see, whereas like, with the Stormlight Archive, it's it's so clear that I, I can practically see it in my head, so um, I, 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 know, I know if I'm finding something really good and immersive, if I can practically see it in my head, what it is, whereas like... Um, a lot of a lot of Dune is is more about just the talking and the dialogue. And it's it's very much about people, huh? Oh yeah, massively. Um, yeah. Especially since the Benny Gesserits are uh, uh, pretty much all about politics. So, so who are the Benny Gesserit to you? Like, tell us about them. Like you're saying, they're about politics. Like, what what do they do? What is their? That's like one of the things that a reader is like, what? And that comes into that human test that um, Cassie was telling us about, Repatriate Girl. Yeah. It's about uh, Paul was talking to the Reverend Mother about Jessica, her, his mom, not knowing who her parents were, but the Benny Jesuits knew, know who everybody's parents were. She makes a big deal about saying, oh, she was tested to be human separating humans from the animal stock but then turns around and starts talking about breeding Jessica like an animal right like and that's a sisterhood that's not like the Baron Harkonnen's idea for example yeah and that's but that feeds into the politics as well because then they're you know trying to pick and choose who weds who who breeds who even if you're second cousins because we want you guys to have a baby that then we can put over here with this family or, or whatever oh my god that's so accurate like that was a very clear rendering of like their massive allegedly <laughs> complicated plans you know you and you and you and you and you and you okay and when you're done then you and you and <laughs> and then eventually we'll have this world <laughs> it's literally that episode of disenchantment where king zog's like you you make married <laughs> where he is the child mm -hmm. um, and then after the test and the, the box and the gong um, it's kind of a bit more it, 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 he starts to understand a little bit more um, but you can kind of see that he has a lot to learn um, and, it's, and it's the way that 
the Reverend Miller is um, really described as you, you hear this an awful lot as well with the, the, how they refer to the victims that it was um, the crones, witches, witch women and right. that it's never like cleric or something. No, um, and it's, it's and, and there's a few ways, and depending on how you see what a crone represents and what witches represent, and that there's a few ways about that. And so I mean, there's, I mean, I don't know, an old crone. I mean, we know that the Reverend Mother, she's a, she's an old woman, uh, past her prime, and perhaps seen by some of the most useless. Um, but then, you know, at the same time. Uh, old woman, she's, you know, wise in her years, she's seen many things, knows an awful lot. Um, and even with, like, the, the whole use of the, you know, the term witch, it comes with a lot of, you know, rather negative, negative images and, um, and that. But also, you know, um, an element of the supernatural, the mysterious, powerful, something to be feared as well. I think especially with the crone. Um, and you kind of sort of see that with Jeff Peach's reactions, um, Oops. or how Paul picks up picks up issues. Sorry, I have to move it for me. Can you disconnect me? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> we both just like sprint away from you. <laughs> well, one thing too, uh, uh, as far as the Reverend Mother, she was very harsh. She was very cold, like you said. She seemed very. I don't care, standoffish, heart of steel kind of thing. And then as she's leaving, when she looks at Jessica and says, I would take this for you if I could. And there are tears. That, that just kind of changes your thinking about her because she seems so heartless at first. And that's how everybody looks at her. That's kind of how they talk about her later. But you have that moment of humanity with her. Yeah. I yeah. Think that's kind of important as well. like to know what that training is so mentats are um able to do what probably like a quantum computer is allegedly supposed to be able to do even though that's not real yet allegedly mm -hmm. and they're supposed to be able to do this in their mind with the help of like drugs okay. a certain chemical cocktail is that right oh, yeah. that's what i got so far and i think they're made by this yeah. group of people named the talaxu and everybody uses them because you can't have computers why not yeah. um allegedly in the past yeah they made them too human that's why there's the human test now something right yeah the butlerian jihad the human test is like more fucked up than the butlerian jihad it's like beyond that the human test is pure eugenics, unfortunately, like, and I don't know why. Yeah, well, that's the thing, it's what I didn't get about, and, and, and this is what, I mean, I can't, I'm in kind of two minds about the test. I don't think it is a human test, but they're saying that it is. And, Your human and, response and, and to pain and itching is to pull away from it. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a right? normal response. Not to sit there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's interesting. I, mean, I think it kind of, I think it, it does rather clumsily explain it after, and this is where sort of Paul is trying to sort of process what just happened. Um, and that's, I think it is done a bit clumsily, and the analogy, which I think is foreshadowing what happens to the Queen and with Duke Leto, um, that kind of sort of, it's kind of, it's a bit muddled this bit, actually, and I think um, so the test is, yeah, is mentioned as a test of sorting animals from humans, um, and it uses the analogy of an animal biting a limb off to escape a trap mm -hmm. versus a human waiting to kill the trapper. And I was like, well, that, that's all very well and good, wait, waiting and enduring the pain, 
to then lead your children to rapture. But in using that analogy to describe what the test is for, they're, they're two separate things without a big space. Um, because, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, if, if you're a human, well, you're, you're presumably smart enough to think, how can I, how can I get myself out of this? How can I spring myself from this trap? Mm -hmm. um, right, right. But I know, I know what happens later, and and I think that this analogy is more related to the um, to the Duke and the lesser of Trades. They're they're going to Arrakis. Arrakis is basically one massive trap. And Duke Fletcher knows this. And oh. you hear about you hear about this trap in, in chapter two where the first woman is uh, going on mm -hmm. about it. Um, so I think I think that is it's that the Benny yeah, the Reverend Mother going on about this this trap. I feel that it's foreshadowing for what's going to happen to the Atreides. But it doesn't it but it's it then gets kind of muddled up with so, I'll be honest, the test I feel is, I should sit down, so I think the, the test is more to see, um, are you, are you purely driven by instinct, so your instinct to play the game is to pull away, um, to, and to get out of here, um, but if you think about it logically, like Paul does after, when he thinks about it, he's like, well, yeah, okay, so my, my mother went through this test. Well, yeah, well, she's still got a hand, and, and the revered Reverend Mother's still got her hand in that. Yeah, why would why would you do this test to actually go out and, and maim somebody in, in, in that? So it's, um... Right. Yeah, so I, th I think, I think, I think they've really kind of sort of got it about our spout face in this chapter with, with the whole thing of the process. And the test is i think it is more about and that they would be the benny gesserit or who, who's the they in this case like is it frank herbert that's gone out of oh. it or is it the benny yeah, gesserit yeah, yeah. i think i think yeah i think he's rather poorly explained it in ah. this, in, um, sorry i wasn't making that clear yeah i think he's kind of kind of sort of really muddled it up um in i think it's probably more of a, a test a yeah, more of a test of do you re do you react, you know, just without thinking, um, or do you respond? So do you take the time to think about things a bit more clearly and a bit more, and not allow yourself to be ruled by fear or pain? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, exactly that. Thank <laughs> um, I was grasping for it too. I'm like, I know what she's trying to. Where is it? There it is. <laughs> yeah, and I think, and I think that's the thing. It's, it's, it's kind of gotten. It, maybe, he, maybe he meant, maybe he intended for that to happen. I don't know, but I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to tell. It's, it's really tell. interesting to think about Herbert's intent as well, because. What I've heard a lot from my students over the years as a Vault Tech University teacher is that everything you said, basically, it's like really alienating. Um, there are other issues that we could consider, too. I think you started to get to them when you talked about the treatment of the appearance of the female sex and gendered body, especially after the experience of age. The way Frank Herbert treats that, we could question, like, is he being respectful, you know? Um, I think about that a lot. Back to what do you understand about the word, the, you know, the, the title of the poem? Um, and certainly, when you look up what poem means, it is meant to mean, you know, um, you know, an old woman who is past her prime, um, who's kind of useless, also a bit sort of sinister as well. Mm -hmm. And I think right. when you think about it, if you think about Paul's place, when he's kind of sort of like half woken up and he is this woman at the door, he wouldn't be a bit afraid. Still, essentially, a child um, at this point. So he would, he would kind 
to be afraid and I'd, I'd be a bit fearful if this strange ghost of yours just appeared in bed next door and they're watching you. So get kind yeah, of just scoping him out, right? Well, when you read that part, I always have the witch from Snow White in my head. Just to not feel, hey, feel horrible about the whole thing, but when they're looking in the room at him, that's what I see him seeing her in the doorway look like the witch from Snow White. <laughs> that's yeah. such a great way to think of it. So if you haven't read I the mean, book and you're just not, a wastelander, but... <laughs> listen to what Rep just said, because it's like... <laughs> it's like that. So that <laughs> makes me think... And their mom's looking in lovingly, and then you have the witch from... No bite. <laughs> yeah, because he depicts the mom like she's like a like Wonder Woman or something, right? Yep. <laughs> she's, she's beautiful and bad. And, and the thing is, I mean, knowing the Betty Jester, it was probably she's probably been she was probably I hate to say bred. No, yeah, you're bad. right. No, yeah. she was bred more than you yep. perhaps are aware. Yeah. And um, if you knew to who well, and with who, too. oh my. But spoilers. <laughs> spoilers. <laughs> Oops, that was a bad picture. There is like a respect for them, um, and respect for the the knowledge, the 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 things that the years and their life experience have given them. They have and, power, right? Yeah, they have mm -hmm. power. Um, like a warrior should fear a crone almost. <laughs> yeah. So interesting to think what she means by that. Like there are layers in that, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but but is he's he's not he's quite arrogant and does sort of respond quite angrily. But you know, initially he is quite you know cautious and timid almost. Um, it's um, yeah, he's he's a bit disrespectful and. See how you would think that somebody who is supposed to be the somebody a child who's supposed to be the you know the one who's going to take the place of Duke Leto would at least be schooled in um, how to deal with people, how to treat people, and how to yeah. Well, she said. Uh the Reverend Mother told Jessica she's shielding him. I mean, she's basically been coddling yes. him, so he hasn't been put into those situations to learn how to, I guess, control your faith. <laughs> is the best way I can think of it. So that way, you know, you're able to deal with that without, you know, showing anger or irritation or disdain or anything like that. You learn how to be more. Oh, I almost want to say political, but that I don't think that's quite the right word. Yeah, they also live in a like in an, they also live in an intensely like stratified and like really fucked up caste system where like yes. he needs to be a spoiled bitch to like get command. It's like really fucked up. Yeah. Um. The heart are so whiny. Yeah, like uh, yeah, exactly. Give me my mentat, right? Like stuff like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. his uncle's plans 
one day he will be there or he will be in, in Byron's place. Um, yeah. I can do the opposite of a spoiler on the Baron and be like, he used to be as sexy as Fade. That's the opposite of a spoiler, right? Yeah, I'm trying to remember that, yeah. Yeah, he was once like, so the Baron wasn't always a monstrous visual apparition. His body used to be pleasing to the eye, uh, was the description. Um, something happened to him. You say there's a story there. Oh, yes, and I remember what happened to him. Yes. We could talk about it, or we could like call it off task. What do you What do you think? Uh, do you remember the Patrick Ross? I don't remember. It's been, God, it was probably yeah. 2003 when I first read this book. So what I heard about on the interwebs when I looked it up was that he refused to do the Benny Gesserit's will once. And then he also tried to mock them. And oh. when he did it, he was so violent and repugnant that they decided to punish him on the spot in a way that would only get worse over time. And here he is. Yeah, because right. yeah, he's got a lot of illnesses, too. Yeah, he's fallen apart. Um, so the Baron is like a massive dude with like some kind of congenital condition going on or something like that, where he can't like... That's why they have all this suspended. Like hold his I'm own also mass. I'm completely yeah. traumatized by the David Lynch movie from when I was a kid because I watched it as a young kid. The Lynch movie's <laughs> odd because they like give him like blisters and things, and I yes. suppose, but yes. I think that <laughs> it it's almost not necessary. I think they should like up the cyborg and like massiveness of him because I think he's just supposed to be like a huge dude, right? I need yeah, to go back yeah, and yeah. find the sci-fi version of it because sci-fi did a whole. I think they did two of them. That version was just like a giant baby, and it was like, okay, but... Yeah. I'll have you go back and find those, too. I like that one. That one's funny. The guild are like, they do that weird hand thing, you know? <laughs> I, lo I really like Children of Dune when sci-fi did that one. I really like that. I keep trying to watch that one, and then I keep falling asleep when I'm watching it. <laughs> But yeah, so the Bene Gesserit are a trip. It sounds like we've decided that the entire planet of Dune is an immense trap to test whether or not the House Atreides could be. And then the question is what? And we don't know. Um, we know that the Bene Gesserit are therefore involved or behind or embedded or embroiled in this massive scheme that other great houses who are like, you know, barons. And we understand that from the apocalyptic aristocracy. There are lords, there are chads. Uh, we get it. Um, and they're all kind of like pawns in a massive fucked up eugenics scheme. Mm -hmm. And that's the species in the situation of Dune spread across like millions of planets. Yeah. I think we've caught our listeners up. Yeah. What, yeah what, well, it kind of, sort of brings on it's a, a, a bit of a joke here, but the Quetzal Cada. Get it. And yeah, and, and, and it's, it's kind of almost like a, another, I feel, looking at it now, um, I don't think I thought much of it way back when ever it was that I read it. I think I've seen the memes of probably about 20 years ago, but um, uh, yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> <laughs> um, Me too, it's okay. <laughs> um, but I, I didn't really sort of, you know, considering I did life science at the time, why don't I pick up? Um, but the Benny Jester say that the the reason that they want this Quintat Hadra, which is basically a male Benny Jester, um, is that they can only see down to the, the sort of the I I'll say she maternal the, line. Yeah, she said feminine path basically. Yeah. Um, and which I don't the, know what the, necessarily that encompasses, but. Only one yeah. half of the coin, basically. Dude, I have so many questions about that, because I'm like, like, yeah. what? Keep going, though. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, no, no, no. Well, uh, it, it might have some... I mean, this is it's kind of where it gets a little bit confusing, um, and I'm not sure exactly what Herbert will be going with this. But, yeah, the Benny Jester are repelled and terrorized by seeing down to the, the 
masculine sort of side of things. Yeah. Um, like what? And I kind of sort of think, and I'm like, why? Um, oh, right. For what reason? He's like, because. And yeah. we're like, why? And he's like, you know. It kind of, yeah, it's, yeah, it's so far field, and it's 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 almost like forbidden knowledge. And even like, I've got like on the other page, which was in such language that a woman with knowledge, training, discipline is dangerous. I mean, because um, the Bene Gesser are, even despite the examples there, they are incredibly disciplined. And they go through such intense training. Um, and they are dangerous. They are, some of them are just insane killers. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think that kind of sort of gets kind of messed a little well, bit. Well, are you sure they're like, what do you mean by insane though? Like, do you mean like the way Tanya is? So like Tanya is an insane killer, right? Like people have to stop her from like raising towns because she's like got issues. No, it's not, like no, that no, or no, 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 no it's more like sneak in sneak out half her room's dead kind of thing. yeah that's yeah. accurate and like no one knows what the hell happened and they'll yeah. never know it's and it's that well martha it, just started today and now she's gone i don't understand why is everybody dead everyone <laughs> everyone's gone <laughs> it's i think that's a lot of that is kind of downplayed is that they are the only weapon that they need are their bodies and i think with so true. About, what we mentioned about the, the Baron Harkonnen, um, their, their bodies also contain um, a lot as well, some of them. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, they are extremely powerful. Take away the politics, they're still extremely powerful um, people. Um, but yeah, but the quest of Hadarach, now, I don't know whether they mentioned it, but the whole, the whole thing about the, 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 the whole breeding I've been breathing like into the mic this whole time, kind of haven't I? Sorry, I, folks. I thought about it this morning and was like, okay, <sighs> so, okay if, if I assume the whole breeding program is based on genes, female is XX, so we get one X chromosome. I think I should turn up um, yeah, honor and steel. Uh, an X chromosome from that. And Y chromosome is always inherited from the man. That if, seems if, good. If you're, if you're a boy. Give a little juice uh, on our Patriot too. And so, so it's yeah, not just my breathing. Okay, so I, I could kind of see maybe that's why, because Benny Jester don't have that Y chromosome. Mm. But then I kind of also sort of maybe think, okay, oh, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's alright. <laughs> Paparoo. Uh, I was kind of sort of thinking about it, and, and, and this was something that we, we discussed about when I was at university, because I did a bit of genetics, and we did a bit of, a bit of genetics um, with, with like X. X chromosomes, Y chromosomes, and that. And oh, I'm so there glad you're bringing this up. There are so many different up. combinations um, for intersex where people appear typically, and I, I know there's a lot of politics and, and language about this, but people that present is female, but they've got Y chromosomes, but because of the number of X chromosomes they've got. So I was a bit sort of thinking to myself, all right, Frank Herbert. Why then can't the Quetzal Hadrach be an intersex person? <laughs> yeah, that's why I was hoping a lot of other people from the Discord would come, because a lot of people in AA have a lot to say about that in a yeah. very educated fashion. And I was really looking forward to bow to their wisdom on that. But um, I think the three of us could say that seems fishy, right? Mm -hmm. on, on Herbert's path, like, or... Or that Benny Gesserit's belief in that, or their repulsion to doing that, is at least fishy. Something there we need to be like, what the hell? I probably is. I think it's probably more about. It probably says more about the time that Frank Herbert wrote this. I can't yeah, because it was sixties. It was yeah, sixties for sure. Yeah, yeah, so they didn't have quite the. But still, you you know, I guess it it's it's it a sci-fi expanded world you know future all sorts of things so why not also yeah and the thing is it's 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 nothing it's it's something it's something that happens it it just happens mm -hmm. um i can't remember all the different reasons why it happened um at conception and, and gametes and everything genetics and are cool it's, Oh yeah, it's so <laughs> fascinating. Thing is, we, we, did, fascinating. We, we did so much, and the thing is, it was it, it was really interesting when when we covered a bit of this, um, and it 
didn't even get onto the whole identity side of it and the social aspect of it. But, um, Attention, certainly citizens. nowadays, Nuclear people talk an awful lot more about that. Don't worry about that nuke, we're in the um, vault, we'll be just fine. So I think anybody reading this book now and picking up on that would have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. um, it is, For sure. Um, I know, I know Irish mentioned it a lot in, in that it is a very, um, it is a very binary gendered um, situation they have going on in June. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, it seems like it is, doesn't it? Like, I mean, it's like, like that's yeah. The Benny Jester about the male and the male and female. Um, yeah. I mean, I have to offer that down the road, those people who I mentioned that build the Mentats. Um, the Talaxu are flesh merchants, basically. They often will kidnap people and, like, rip out their organs, do things. It's, it's, anyways. Um, they also create something called the Face Dancer, which is, like, a completely fluid being, basically. So, like, Interesting. yeah, and I don't want to fuck with anything too much, but those are there right up until the end, basically. Um, but we don't know about them now because they don't exist in book one, right? Okay. Um, beyond that, I often wonder, because as the book goes along, we'll see how Paul feels about the Bene Gesserit. Um, and I often wonder, like, am I supposed to make something of his critique of the Bene Gesserit? Or is he just kind of thrashing about in a teenage way? You know, I... I um, because the other thing is that... As far, when I open the book, uh, you know, you get past all the corporate bullshit, right? Um, you know, you, you get to reading it. It's from the Manual of Muad'Dib by the mm -hmm. Princess Urulan. So, a woman is speaking to me, is what I'm getting from page one. Right? So, what history am I reading? I don't know. I approach it that way kind of thing. I think I'm rambling too much. No, that's a good point. That is a really good point, and something that I hadn't actually considered. I I'll have to pay attention to that more. I am bending over backwards to defend the author uh, in public, so that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Paul also has a really limited scope of knowledge um, and like experience. experience of, well, just of, with the whole Benny Desert, yeah. too, because... Uh, you know, he just knows his mom. He's just now met the Reverend Mother. He has no idea about really what the scope of what the entire society, if that be the best way to put it, religion yeah. is. I mean, because it's pretty, like we've talked about, it's really in everything basically shapes the world. Yeah, the religion is really odd because it's like Buddhism with Islam. But it like I've feels wanted Catholic. To know more. Is is there and actually I should probably know. Is there a book that just is about that? Because I've always wanted to know more, but I didn't know which one. Yeah, I um I use my Audible credits because I still am foolish enough to have an Amazon subscription, and I feel really bad about it. So don't at me, <laughs> internet. I'm really sorry. I know how bad it is in there. I know what they're doing to you, like vacation time, and I'm really sorry. <laughs> Anyways, um. Uh, his son's prequel series is like, hey, this is like where the Fremen came from. This is the Machine Crusade thing. You know, here's the Butler and Jihad, okay. blah, blah, blah. Okay, all right, I'll go find those. Because, yeah, when I finished it, there was so much more I wanted to know about, but then life happened. So yeah. So once in a while, I'll look at it and go, oh, I did want to know. Like the, I know there's a background story. I know that they b did more books because I had more questions when I was <laughs> done with the books. <laughs> I must know more. His son's, like, even more frustrating, though, because his son, like, really emphasizes, like, shall we say, like, skinny Caucasian female bodies. And it's just, like, I I get that the Benny Gesserit, like, breed for this, but, like, even Frank kind of, like, didn't do it that this, this much. I don't know. Stuff like that. He didn't put that much emphasis on it. I guess it prob What's probably up? could also be How you doing, a Wolf? comment on the definition of beauty yeah. in the various times as well. Oh dang! You can even say that about the. You can even say that about the Baron Harkonnen, and that he is depicted as being. He is depicted as being grossly overweight, grotesque, horrible, and and, and his whole. Both of our avatars just covered their eyes. 
and and his whole his whole his whole personality of that. I mean, is. I'm glad to hear that. Thanks for coming through. This is Voltec University. His physical form with right now, Repatriate Girl is here with and, an honor and steel. Still going over Dune. There's, there's still a lot of people who believe that as well. Yeah, that, I was going to say, you're just opening up a chapters. whole other conversation of, you know, oh, yes. first Sirens outside. assumptions based on somebody's, the way somebody looks. I mean, you see somebody that's overweight, you automatically go, oh, they don't do anything. They're lazy. They don't take care of themselves. They just sit around and eat donuts all day long and drink Coke. And, you know, when that's rarely, if maybe a point zero 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 one percent of the situation ever, or you look at somebody skinny and just automatically make all these assumptions. Right. You know, as opposed And to I don't know what know. Coke is, but I do know what Nuka Cola is. <laughs> <laughs> special kind of special kind of Nuka Cola. Yeah. But that's they're like your moral character as well, because he is he is not a nice person. Yeah. Uh, that's true. right. So it's so, it, it, so, I mean, there's like a lot that I've seen in it, and I just sort of think, oh, wow, you know, this is quite fat phobic, actually. <laughs> it is, it is, huh? And I think that I really enjoyed um, thinking about it the way Re Repatriate Girl just brought up, too, because it's like, it, so Honored Steel is totally right. It is, it is like, like bringing up phobias. And so, like, crone phobia, right? Fat phobia. Um, like, but then the three of us are already ready knowing how evil the baron is to like pity him you know and i think that's super interesting because we can only do that through this author's work right so well, I, like usually you kind of almost do with characters like this because you know there's a reason they ended up that way i mean right and you know he's like trying to work out like like full disclosure the baron shreds his body apart trying to stay alive like and fit it cannot stay fit like because of what happened to him And a lot of people live like in a way where their bodies maybe are tuned just such that like the times and conditions we're in, it like doesn't work for you. And I, I often think about that, like the structures of the way we live are, are shown to like be a reflection of like our value or something. And it's just like, that's not fair at all. Yeah. Yeah. Unless, unless you're this, what is the ideal anymore? That's the thing. But unless, I have unless no you idea. Fit into this very yeah. narrow, arbitrary definition of whatever you know, it's like then you must have done. You must have done something to deserve <laughs> this. You must have done something to deserve that. And, and it's just sort of like, oh, you know, really? Can we can we move past that now? Because you know that is so last century. <laughs> yeah i think about that with the human test too because it's like why is the only solution to wait to kill the hunter like what what if there is a way to convince the hunter they don't need to trap you right i don't know <laughs> like yeah. or why do you want to honestly why do you want to wait around because you might be dead by then that so too do you want to risk chewing your arm out of the trap or waiting to maybe be alive to then maybe be able to kill the hunter assuming you're still strong enough at that point as a bloody build fuck my arm <laughs> yeah, in a, in, a real, in a real life situation, I mean, there's been there have been instances in real life where people have had, um, you know, through misadventure or whatever. Oh, that know, guy that didn't of, cut his leg off or his arm off or something. Yeah, from that one movie with that one guy. Yeah, and 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 in a way, don't you think that that is kind of almost the the, the mentality that you would have to have in order to be able to do that wouldn't it almost be like the um, the the fear thing you know that um, yes I realize that this is gonna hurt and I realize this is the absolute last thing I should be doing but in order to ensure my survival is the only thing I can do and that, that takes some nerve in fact it, it, I would argue that in order to do that it takes a hell of a lot of nerve for a human being to do that to themselves. Mm -hmm. um, you would you would need to have the strength of will that you would need to have to pass the Benny Gesser test in order to be able to cut off your own limb and survive <laughs> um, to escape and something like that. It's very true. I would argue that, yeah. Um, yeah, because that's not something... <laughs> 
You're not just like pulling a, a blister, the top of a blister off. You're talking about severing your wrist or, you know, your leg. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. There's like, it's hard for us to understand there. how painful it is, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's, so I, I guess it's in, in that, understanding that, knowing that, it, it, may, it may be quite different for an animal, you know, because they are just thinking purely of survival. Yeah, okay, a person is thinking of survival as well, but it is... It kind of goes even more against, yeah, yeah. It takes a hell of a strength of character and, and will to do that. It's not. It, I, I think if you, yeah, using that as an analogy, yeah, it's a, that's it's not just it's not just animal instinct. I think as well, the fighting against it too much. Ugh, yeah. Yeah, and so that's a big thing that his whole family ends up doing is like this planet is known to be a place that is like a graveyard of households uh sort of like how many geographic locations on earth where people live are considered by certain empires to be graveyards um instead of actual places of living which is interesting too um so kaladin is like maybe um planet england honestly where it's like always moody and stormy and ocean like what do you think Orchards, yeah, okay. It does. It, it mentions planet so France. I don't know. It's like planet <laughs> temperate. You know, it's like not. It's, it's not like sunny, comfortable. but it's comfortable. Yeah. Just right. They have water, so they they're stoked. Good they have like that. rice and fish, uh, and eels and stuff. That's like their that's like their thing. Um, and then they end up in charge of the planet that has this hyper addictive, super dangerous future drug <laughs> that you get out of. Um, like oh, wow. yeah <laughs> I, you know, I still i still don't understand the whole spice process and that and like is it is it just in the ground i know that the worms have something to do with it and even though i read the books i was just sort of like you know, as a biologist and a zoologist i still don't understand this ecosystem at all <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's super weird. So there's like um, no water on the planet. It never rains. Um, and it's so dry and dusty that there are like intense static energies that create huge so-called Coriolis storms that will like what the local indigenous po folk, the Fremen call it, the storm that eats flesh off the bones. And scientists are always like, that's not a good name. But like, that's how they call it. Um, and that's because it's literally so devoid of water that, like, the whole place is a freaking nightmare zone. Um, but these worms cruise about, and they're kind of, like, sightless. So they're guided by, like, vibration, I guess. Um, yes. And sense of something else. And they both guard and produce the, the planet's only export, that drug, spice. It's not, I guess... It becomes pharmacopic, but it is just an organic byproduct. Uh, and what happens is these little sand trout create membranes around any kind of water. And then, like, they, like, plant cells unify into one giant living kind of sea slug type creature, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then that's the worm. And then when it dies, um, it, like creates like a huge spice deposit and then that restarts the process okay that was nice it was right thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah so it gets weirder later in the series oh, but yes. oh. um basically sand trout are little tiny things they suck up the water they join up they make the big worms the worms are scary worms are big Yep. <laughs> yeah, and they kind of like hold the water. So there's like um, a membrane of sand trout beneath the desert that lock in moisture as well, so that there's never any like nighttime water either, like we would experience. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, and isn't there like a? There's, I know it's for like a later thing, but the Fremen have this thing with water and it's got something in it and makes you go bloody. <laughs> That's gonna be really fun to talk about. We'll have to take Nuka Shine when we do that. <laughs> yeah. For that episode. I'll have to decorate this room better because I forgot to put decorations up. <laughs> we'll come in a uh, Fashnock mask. 
That's a great idea. Oh, I don't think I've got any on team two, so it's perfect. I have I too many. You can have all of mine. Say, we could probably find you some. Wouldn't be a problem. You can even burn mine. I don't. I just like get them away. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, if Forder wants like a death claw mask, I, I gotta have one on one of these characters somewhere around here. Bethesda should really let us pass around the old man winter masks so that the power armor ones so that people stop, you know, killing themselves over it, you know? Yeah. I don't even want mine. I just keep it because I'm like, well, shit, if it's that rare, I don't want to insult everybody by throwing it away. That mask is dope. I love using that in nuclear winter. It's super cool. So... Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, so um, I think we've got a lot going on to think about. Um, and then I think one thing we should trace throughout is like the author's intent. Um, we should definitely be willing to hold the author accountable while enjoying their book at the same time. I think that's something we have to do moving forward as a species somehow. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, I was listening to this guy, Sun Ra, who's like a musician and like a spirit being or whatever. But he was basically saying, anytime you say something, you're casting a spell, basically. And as a gamer, I was like, of course, man. It's a bit of code, like every word, right? So, I mean, we mustn't just let things go, but it doesn't mean we have to burn them either. It's an interesting thought. Yeah, we should learn... Uh, we should go through his lecture sometime too after we're finished with all this it's wild he just like says words and he's like and that means that and it also means that it's basically gibberish but it's so fun to listen to <laughs> Can I, it's, um, are we the reach you play control no Ooh, what's that I've heard really good things about it though yeah it is on pc now it kind of um, without making too much of a spoiler there is this thing called the board and it's quite interesting in that when you when you come across some of the things that it says, um, you kind of think, why is it, why 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 is that there? Um, it'll it'll say a sentence and it'll have a word and then a slash and then another word and then a slash and another word. And they all they're all related or they're synonyms of like a, of like the 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 other words in the sentence. Um, some of them are quite. I just had to prove to you I'm almost out of water again. Leaders yeah, upon leaders. Um, but they Oops. all essentially mean the same thing. And there's, it's, it's also interesting to see the, the, the word choice that they use um, for the, the board lines um, to sort of gauge, to sort of see their sort of intent and their meaning. Because although they're, they're similar words, they can mean the same thing. So there's a slight variation between the words. It, it kind of gives a different edge to different Also, some of the sort of the underlying meanings as well. Like they're they're also you know, messages that they're trying to get across to the uh, characters. The essay. Um, yeah, especially some of those where they can almost seem, although they're trying to sort of help, they're also sometimes quite threatening or um, mocking or, or, or various different things. Um, certainly, the, the ones that I noticed were like that. Could you interpret to does a threat that word? Yeah. That word isn't, um, and, and I always find that quite interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. Words, words, have, words have meaning, words have weight. I think of words as like little time machines too. And I think of Dune as a time machine as well. Um, because it's like a packaged protein molecule kind of thing where it's like it's encoded information, but it like it's from the past you know and it's like the sum of like experiences that were like lived right uh 
and it's like interpersonal as well words are so so a book must be is, is, is such a thing um i don't know i like to think of dune as like this like backwards time machine loop where when you finish it you understand the first book and you like begin anew or whatever um sorry to move again because so much happens in the series that like you start to realize the author never perhaps xyz right that you thought before but as it stands we have a very precocious youth paul atreides we have a very prestigious and yet modest house the atreides um perhaps more martial than opulent uh is what we're getting um we have a shadowy sisterhood of badass super soul sisters i guess who have interesting thoughts on what breeding should be uh that we are kind of worried about um we have a planet full of giant worms a galaxy full of feuding uh sort of like aristocrats and slaves which is super dark for our species in the future i think that's a powerful lesson for us to consider actually is that so many would think that um and i don't want to name names because they've been getting a lot of bad press and i, just, I don't want to be rude to them but so many would think that simply by acquiring tech such as ai and space travel um the species would become oh liberated yes and i think herbert's like well no because this is what a machine is a machine is a way to train yourself to see other people as machines instead of people um, and to become a machine yourself and actually i think to its credit fallout 76 has a lot to offer us about that theme i've covered it a lot in the past um but factions like the enclave um are in thrall to an ai and no matter what they have to say about how much control they have at the end of the day they are serving an ai right whether or not that ai is the right choice is f for them to say but they're not in charge right um and then yeah it's so clear that he's in control right yeah so Sodas is such a dark example. Oh my god. The suffering she inflicted. Um, the, the thinking machines do stuff like that in the Butlerian Jihad because they're they're aware and they're conscious, but they're not empathetic. So they can't really like figure out why people trip out about things like brain dissections. They're just like, why would you care that we did that? Well, um, what else have we discovered thus far? Are you all familiar with um, the knife fighting in the shields yet? Have we covered that? Yeah, I did, I did kind of read up a little bit to that. and um, Oh gosh, I've remembered some of the thoughts that I had on that as well. Um, yeah. yeah, I read a little bit about that. That would need to go back and yeah. uh, take more notes and um, actually get my thoughts on the page. They're, it's so funny because they have like they have like advanced technology, but then it's also like limited, and they just don't bother to innovate it. <laughs> so like, they have shields, but you can get through it with a knife. You just can't shoot yeah, if through you it. Go really slow. Very <laughs> slowly. Uh, and and the thing is, I'm kind of. Yeah, I'm not gonna. You know what? I'll save my thoughts on that for another time because I. Well, not now, but I did read stage combat, and I'm thinking of it. In, in that sort of terms, I'm like, that's really difficult. <laughs> yeah, actually. Yeah. Um, so then I guess let's perhaps, do you feel like we've covered enough for today on Dune, <laughs> friends? Yeah, we've had some really good conversation. Yeah. Yeah, quite a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, social things, uh, a lot of different social, can't think of the word. <laughs> commentary <of things>. <laughs> yes yes yeah there's definitely a lot of moving pieces to consider well um do y'all want to maybe go shoot something and call it a day we'll round out the stream sure cool cool 
All right, well, I'll go into um, closing credits. Thank you so much for being here, you two. Yeah, thank you. Dude, this was fun. And Repatriate, no one came to kill you, even though we are in a public server. I know. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that amazing? <laughs> isn't that amazing? Yeah, I'm <laughs> Waiting outside. Yeah, the world didn't like that. Well, the beauty of Vault Tech University is it actually is hard to get into the atrium without revealing yourself and getting wanted. <laughs> Unless you know the secret path, right? Yes, which I still can't find. Oh, that's why I built the back door. Um, but even that is locked. All right, I'm going to get a raid going and then, I don't know, let me know what you all want to do. Viewers, thank you so much for chilling with us today as we covered a bit and we'll see you soon um i gotta do a bunch of like real life work stuff today um but yeah it was good to do a bit of a bit of all tech university talk on do look forward to doing that more in the future i will see you all later well he's got an entrance outside that's really cool um Figure All right, out ciao. how to... <laughs>